Welcome to the worship of Almighty God here at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church. We are delighted to have you here. It is the second week in Advent, which makes us one week closer to the Christmas season, but we're not there yet. We're in the season of anticipation and the season of preparation. We are so glad that you are here, and it's a great day to worship God together. Let's worship God.
one of the best things about worship is being able to do it together, that you don't do it by yourself. Even when you are not physically with other people, you still share in this practice together. And so we take time during each and every worship service to greet one another with the love of Christ. And so with that in mind, uh, I would ask you to pause your video, reach out to someone, text them, call them, email them, do something just to let them know that you appreciate them, that you are glad that they are in your life, and let us pass the peace of Christ by greeting one another with the love of Christ. The people living in the darkness have seen a great light. We light this candle in hope. We light this candle for peace. Listen to how the prophet Isaiah spoke of peace. Jesse was King David's dad. His family grew big and strong like a giant tree. But then it was cut down and all that was left was a stump. But now a new little tree is growing out of that stump and fruit will grow on its branches. The Spirit of God will help that little tree become wise and to always do the right thing. The little tree that grows out of the stump will bring the whole world together in peace. Even the animals will live in peace. Wolves and lambs will be best friends. Leopards and goats will play together. Baby cows and lions will share a meal together. And a little child will lead them around. And just like that, the whole world will know who God is. Please pray with us. Faithful God, you are at work to restore the entire world to peace. Give us your peace that we may be reconciled to all enemies in the peace that passes all understanding. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. If I told you my story, you would hear hope that wouldn't let go. And if I told you my story, you would hear love that never gave up. And if I told you my story, you would hear lies, but it wasn't mine. If I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than oh, all my sin. Of when justice will serve And when mercy wins Of the kindness of Jesus That draws me in Oh, to tell you my story Is to tell of Him If I told you my story You would hear victory Over the enemy and if I told you my story, you would hear freedom that was won for me. And if I told you my story, you would hear life overcome the grave. If I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sin of when justice was served and when mercy wins of the kindness of Jesus draws me in oh to tell you my story is to tell of him this is my story this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long.
couple of things going on in the life of the church. One, as we're in the second week of Advent, uh, now's the time to uh, follow in on the Advent devotionals if you haven't already. Uh, they're in the weekly mailing. Uh, there are devotionals, weekly devotionals for an, an all-family devotional or just an interpersonal devotional. Uh, they're both, they're great. They're very, uh, involve lots of uh, different learning styles and, and things like that. So um, take part in that. We have those available to you. Um, also, we have uh, the Christmas pageant that's coming up. Uh, a lot of you have written back to say that you'd be interested in, in helping out with that, but uh, even if you haven't heard of that yet and you'd like to help out, uh, let us know, contact us. Um, we are going to, this week, I'm going to start getting out scripts and stuff and, and assigning parts and, and giving everyone opportunities to do that. So much like we do this worship service every week, we're going to have people record their parts separately and then we'll combine them all together for one larger Christmas pageant that we'll be able to use uh, later uh, in the service as we get closer to Christmas. So if you'd like to be involved in that, uh, let us know at the church. Uh, office, um, contact us and or just respond to the weekly email and, and say uh, there's a way to click and just says I want to be involved in the uh, virtual Christmas pageant. It's for all ages and it'll be super fun. I'm really excited about it. And like I said, we'll start getting information out to everybody this week. Good morning, guys. So I have a question to ask you, but first I have to tell you a short story. And so listen closely and then I'll ask you the question. So pretend like this is your first day of school, okay? Not only is it a new school year, but it is also a new school building. And at some point during the first day of school, you had to leave your regular classroom and go to another classroom. Except on your way, you get lost because the hallways are all confusing and it's a big school and you don't know where to go. Can you imagine? Maybe this has happened to you before. So you see a teacher in the hallway. This teacher is not a teacher you know, but you don't care because you just want to get back to your regular class at this point. So you go to the new teacher and you say, dear teacher in the hallway, I don't know how to get back to my classroom. Can you point me in the right direction, please? Now here's the question. Do you think that that teacher is gonna help you or just keep going, ignore you, not point you in the right direction? Yes or no, what do you think? Well, it just so happens, the answer is yes, of course. That teacher is gonna help you out. That teacher is gonna say, do you see that corner you came from? You made the wrong turn, you need to go the other way, make a right instead of a left, go down there, you'll find your classroom really easily. And then you're gonna follow his directions and return safely to your regular classroom and your regular teacher. Teachers are there to help us and point us in the right direction, right? In today's scripture story, we hear a similar story, except the hallway teacher is John the Baptist. And in the scripture story, we hear that John the Baptist is out in the middle of the wilderness telling whoever finds him that they need to repent. The word repent here simply means to turn around. This is the same thing that the teacher in the hallway said in our story, right? The teacher said to get back to your classroom, you turn the corner, go right instead of left, go the other way. That's how you get to where you need to be. John the Baptist here is telling people the same thing. He says, you've made some wrong turns, so what you need to do is turn around and go in the other direction. That's how you're gonna get to your teacher, Jesus. In a lot of stories, it certainly seems like Jesus works alone. But what we're reminded of in today's scripture story is that there are other teachers like John the Baptist who help Jesus. Those teachers help point people towards Jesus when they get turned around or make a wrong turn. And the same, and the same is still true for us today. Sometimes we get turned around or confused or lost and we don't know what to do. But as a community, as a church, we help remind each other and point each other back towards Jesus. In other words, we can all help Jesus just like John the Baptist did by reminding and helping each other keep our attention on Jesus' ministry and teachings. If you have a situation that you don't know what to do, what to say, maybe you're having problems with a bully at school, or maybe you're not getting along with your siblings, or maybe you're really stressed with all the assignments you have at school, God has put people in your life to help you. Okay, you have, you have adults in your life that you can trust, that you can talk to. We have others to help us, to guide us when we're feeling lost. And the same thing is 
with you, maybe with your younger siblings or even your parents or your friends. Sometimes they're gonna feel lost. Sometimes they're gonna feel confused. Sometimes they're not gonna know what to do. But thankfully, they even have you to help them, to point them towards love, towards Jesus when they're feeling lost and confused. Community is a beautiful thing. That's the good news for today. Let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus and the people you've placed in our lives to point us towards him. Please, please help us to remind each other to look towards you, God. I pray all this in your name. Amen. See you guys. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Another big aspect of worship is recognizing that all that we have comes from God. Uh, an opportunity to demonstrate our trust in God, to, to show that we want to be part of what's going on, that we believe that God is going to continue to bless us and continue to care for us, even when we may not know what's going on or, or why things are happening. Um, we do this through a thing called offering. It's, it's recognizing uh, that we trust that God is still here, that God is still doing things. We don't do this because we think God needs our gifts. Uh, we do it because we think God wants us to be involved in what's going on. Uh, more than just financial, God wants us to take part in what's happening in the ministry that God is doing in the world to bring about uh, peace and hope and joy and love throughout the world. Uh, we have opportunities to do this financially. If you would like to give to the church, you can donate online at wexfordcpc.org slash give. You could also send uh, things directly to the church. They get deposited each and every week. But again, it's also an opportunity to think of what are other ways that we can be involved? What are other ways that we can help one another? Uh, even if it's not a church event, what are ways in which you could do something that you could then share with the community to say, hey, I did this and it was really helpful. It was something that I really enjoyed doing. It's something where my gifts could be demonstrated. Think of the ways in which God has blessed you. Think of the things that you have that you love, the things that you are good at doing, the things that you enjoy doing. How can you use those for God to help other people? So with all that in mind, now's the time that we present to God a portion of our tithes and our offerings. Good morning. Please join with me in the prayers of the people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ you taught us to pray and promised that we would receive all that we ask in his name. Hear now our prayers for the church universal, 
for this congregation, its mission and ministry, for the healing of the earth, for peace and justice in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and the oppressed, for the bereaved and lonely, for all who need healing. Guide us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This week's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Listen to the word of the Lord. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will rep- Prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the Baptist was in the wilderness, calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, One stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this week's passage is a familiar one for this time of year as we are in the season of Advent, uh, which again just means uh, arrival, coming. Um, It's the time where we prepare for the coming King. Uh, This is the passage of John the Baptist. This tends to be the John the Baptist week, uh, the second Sunday in Advent, where we hear about John the Baptist. Now, again, we're so familiar with the story that we can kind of get used to all of the tropes and all of the markers throughout it. Last week, we talked about uh, expectation versus anticipation. Uh, Expectation is when you already know what's coming. It's like when you watch a movie for the second or third or fourth time. Uh, Anticipation is knowing something's coming, but you aren't exactly sure what's happening, like when you watch a movie for the first time. as we are in this season of COVID, this season of quarantine, this season of whatever is going on in 2020, uh, none of us have been down this road before. Uh, it looks very similar. Uh, we, we're driving by the same landmarks, but we're driving on a different road than we have before. And so uh, as we approach this Christmas season, we can lament that uh, all the familiarity is gone, or we can use this opportunity to see things in a different way, to see things from a different perspective and a different angle, where it's like we're seeing the houses from behind uh, instead of the normal street that we drive on. So this is one of those stories, that one of those characters that comes along early in the story, John the Baptizer, John the Baptist, uh, who we're familiar with, but we're not really familiar with. So John is a really important character because John is a prophet. And if you remember, the, uh, oftentimes the Old Testament is referred to as the law and the prophets, the law being the Torah, the prophets being the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, the, the writings. So the, the Tanakh is the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, which is an acronym for Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Uh, Nevi'im and Ketuvim are, are the two writings, and those are the, the books of prophecy, basically. Uh, and the prophets are Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, um, Elijah, Elisha, all of those people who uh, are really 
the main way in which God communicates with people for generations. They're the mouth of God. They're like the megaphone of God for many of those things. And prophets are very different than pastors or teachers or things like that. Prophets are preparing for something. They are blazing a trail. Um, so even that phrase trailblazing, blazing a trail is when um, uh, people are cutting through a jungle uh, or they may even be doing it with, with torches to blaze the trail, to burn out a spot, to cut away a spot so that others can travel behind them, to make a trail through the woods, through the forest, through the, the brush, the wilderness. So pr that's what prophets are. They're going where no one has gone before and they have a rough job and no one likes them. So as we look in our society uh, for prophets, oftentimes we're gonna find prophets as the people who make us uncomfortable, uh, who really force us to look at things differently than the way we wanted to. And John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, is one that should be no different. So John comes along, he looks very different, he looks very Old Testament, uh, he looks very uncomfortable. Um, it's been 400 years at the beginning of this story, so this is Mark, this is the first gospel written um, of the four gospels, even though it comes second, those aren't in chronological order. Uh, and it's been 400 years since there's been any writings, since uh, Malachi, the last of, of the writings. And so uh, not much has happened. And then the first thing that we have in this book is a guy who connects us to those Old Testament prophets saying, things are going to start happening again. Because really, Malachi, the last thing you get is this prophet who says, when are things going to happen? When's the Messiah going to come? 400 years later, we have John the baptizer show up and say, now. So John uh, is preaching repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's important to remember also that we kind of take repentance to be the moral, we, we, we put everything in, in moral, uh, we have a moral theology by and large. If you are good, then God will love you. It's not what the repentance means. Repentance just means to change. Change what, the way you're doing things. Now, that can be moral. There's nothing wrong with improving morally, but that's not the goal of what Jesus is doing. Jesus is not get, coming here for us to act morally, at least in the sense of uh, personal piety. Uh, don't, he's not here so that we are good people who obey all the rules. That was what the religion was at the time. Instead, it's uh, repentance for the forgiveness of sins, changing the way you act and then being forgiven of the sins that you've committed, not to wipe away those sins, but to change what you've done, to change the outcome of what those sins usually get and to change the, like so that you don't do those things anymore. And the sins that, that Jesus is highlighting are not the moral ones. They're the uh, oppressive ones. There's the societal ones. They're the ones that would leave people hungry or naked or sick or alone or orphaned or stuck in prison. Jesus highlights exactly that list that I just said as the people who we should be called to serve. It doesn't talk about our behavior so much as our care for others. And so John is coming into a world in which that moralistic religion has become the, the bedrock religion of the society, a temple-based religion that is about personal piety and purity. And John is saying, get ready, make straight paths for the one who is coming. And he's even better than me. And so repent because he's coming. And again, we hear that word repent a lot of times in that sense. Repent for the end is near. It's like a, uh, a kind of weird uh, prophetic Aristotle type person holding a sign, marching, ranting in downtown uh, in the middle of the city and scaring people and saying, the world is going to end. That's not what's going on here. What it kind of is, John is saying, the whole system that you have is going to end. And so you should think about changing the way you act because you're, right now you're acting in accordance with a system that isn't going to last. And so you should repent and be ready because 
the Messiah is coming, but not like you think the Messiah is going to be. This Messiah is very different. There are, uh, there's a song called People Get Ready. It's by the uh, Imperials, I think. Um, it's uh, Curtis Mayfield, who, who's a super fly later. Um, but it's, it's a early, I don't think it's from Motown, but it's an early R&B song from the early 60s that is just beautiful. I uh, highly recommend you look it up, listen to it. It's just a very soft song. It just says, people get ready, the trains are coming. You don't need no ticket, you just get on board. Uh, and uh, the very last line, you don't need no ticket, you just praise the Lord, uh, which is wonderful. And he said uh, he had grown up in the church, and it kind of reminded him of the old spirituals that they sang. And he said, I was feeling, I must have been feeling pretty religious when I wrote that song. It's not an inherently religious song, but it's just talking about, um, and, it, and it echoes with African-American spirituals, and then it's talking about kind of this relief from where we are. Um, and it's a good, it's a good passage for us right now. This story starts where we are. It starts in the wilderness. It starts in this place that is not where we are used to being. And it starts with a character who is not who we thought we would be listening to. Um, a character who uh, is right, a character who knows what, uh, who is speaking truth, but is saying, you're really going to have to change what you're doing um, because the system isn't going to be around much longer. As we are desperately trying to go back to normal, the more we push it, the more we realize that normal is a long ways away and that normal may never be normal again. That doesn't mean that the world is ending. That doesn't mean that our lives are over. That doesn't mean that uh, society is crumbling, but it does mean that the way that we used to do things is not working anymore. And that's, this is not just about the virus. This is about everything. This is, uh, there are things that we have based our existence upon. The ways in which we relate to one another, the ways in which we are in community together that just aren't working. That the disparity between those who have and those who do not has become egregious to the point that it's hard to ignore anymore. And it's in the midst of this that we hear the voice of the prophet coming and telling us, you got to change. You got to do things differently because the Messiah is coming and everything that you know is going to be different. So it's not change, hurry up and change out of, it's not fear. John the Baptist is not trying to scare people into changing. He is saying, whether you like it or not, things are going to change. And so get ready. Don't be surprised when this guy comes and is very different and reveals to you how, how broken everything is and how this new way of doing things will change things. I baptize with water, but he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And that's going to change you. So get ready to be changed. Get ready to be made new. Get ready to be something different than what you are right now. As we are in the midst of this season of Advent, in the week that we celebrate peace, it's important to know that peace is not the opposite of war. Because the opposite of war is nonviolence or, or just not fighting, basically. Uh, peace is more than that. So it's not a cessation from fighting. Peace is living with one another. Peace is not just a, 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 an armistice or, or, or a ceasefire. It is a full-on change 
in the way that we operate, the way that we see each other. Peace is no enemies. Peace is no tears. Peace is no fighting. We have uh, holidays set up to celebrate peace and we have changed them to celebrate other things. Um, we don't think about peace in the way that it's an attainable thing. We think it's great. Like uh, if we all, I'd like to buy the world a Coke and sing in harmony. I mean, that, the ideal of being able to do something together uh, is great, but we don't really think it's going to happen. And if we do, we're definitely not living as though it's going to happen. Uh, we still have lots of weapons. We still are, have military things all over the world, not just our country. I mean, we're the biggest at all that we have. Our, our military is bigger than I think the next three combined. So like China and Russia, and I don't know who the third one is, but all three of them combined is still, I think ours is like twice the size of those combined or something like that. So this isn't just saying that, like we as a world are militarized, but in America, we're, we're really good at it too. We have a system that's based on keeping peace through war. That's like fighting fire by setting things on fire, fighting fire with matches. That system doesn't really work and it doesn't really make any sense. Jesus is coming into a world in which that is a reality. Uh, it's not the Americans because we don't exist yet, but it's the Romans. The Romans were an empire that existed for a real long time, but it was based on war and keeping peace through war. The threat of war kept peace and that their military might scared everybody into peace until it didn't anymore. And you achieve this thing called the Pax Romana, which is Roman peace, which only really was a fleeting idea because again, it's fighting fire with matches. Like it, it's, it doesn't really logically make any sense. It's fighting war with the threat of war. That system doesn't make any sense. As we seek to be people of peace, as we seek to be people who are ready to repent, ready to change, we need to think about all of the systems that we are part of, whether or not we actively are participating in them, because we're part of them. And so if we're not actively trying to repent of them or change them, then we're still in them. If you're in a boat and everybody is sailing or everybody's rowing in one direction, if you just stop rowing, that doesn't really change what's happening in the boat. You're still going in the same direction. You would either need to try to tell people, like if the boat is going to go over a waterfall, so you're all in this canoe and you're going towards a waterfall. If you just stop rowing your, your oar, that boat is still going to go over the waterfall. What you need to do is either row against what everybody's doing, so it'll kind of turn the boat, or tell everybody else in the boat, hey, everybody, there's a waterfall there. We have, to, we have to change doing what we're doing. Unless we are actively working against the systems which are causing the problems, then we're just passengers in a boat that is going to go over the edge. And John is telling us to repent from the society the culture, the system that we have been part of. Because Jesus is coming. And Jesus has a system that doesn't, that isn't compatible with this one. So let's not be surprised by it. Let's get ready for it. Let's be able to hear it rather than trying to defend our system in the face of Jesus's, uh, Jesus's plan for the world. Uh, let's be ready to know which one is the right one, which one is worth choosing. Our goals and society and our culture or Jesus' way for the world. The way of peace, which is not through might, but through sacrifice. Jesus conquers death by dying. Jesus fights against war by not fighting. 
Jesus shows love for those who do not love him. That's a hard system. But it's a better one. And this is a time for us to prepare to accept that reality as a better one. So as we are in this really unique opportunity to see Christmas in a brand new way, to see Advent in a brand new way, to see the incarnation of Christ in a brand new way, let us take this time on this journey, on our way towards Christmas, to look around and see the ways in which we have become so divided and so separated and so focused on things that are not peace and hope and joy and love. Let us reorient our minds for those four things. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we may uh, love justice or seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Let us repent. Let us prepare for the coming King. Amen. So now it's time for us to go. It's time for us to end our time here together, uh, this holy space of worship that we have been a part of, that we've shared in together. 
and to go back to the rest of the world, go back to our lives. But we don't go into the world bringing God to the world. Instead, we go bearing witness to and following God, bearing witness to what God is already doing, helping others to see that God is alive and active among them, and helping us to see that as well. Go with eyes that would see God in ways that you hadn't seen before. Go with eyes that are not looking for safety, but are looking for uh, the signs of God, the, the, the faith and the hope and the love, the peace and the joy that are are the fingerprints of God, like just all over everything. And then help people to see that too. So go from this place being people of peace, seeking peace in your relationships, seeking peace in your own life, and seeking peace in the world. Let us be people who are part of the change that happens in this world, rather than passengers on a, on a, in a canoe that we don't think is going in the right direction, but we're doing very little to change the course of where it's going. Let us go with hope. Let us go knowing that God goes before us. And let us help others to see the goodness of God in all that we say and do. So let's go. And as we do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Have a wonderful week. I hope that uh, we get some winter weather. It was really nice having snow this week, although if you don't like the snow, it's all gone, so that was really nice that it went away. Uh, uh, maybe the Steelers will play again this week. We'll see. I don't, it seems to be kind of TBD as the way the system goes right now. Uh, but whatever you do this week, have a wonderful week. Take care of each other. Uh, and uh, be mindful of what God is doing in the world and in your lives. Uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great week.